the typewriter You present it to me A choice to stand or fall, I chose it all Welcome back to The Place of Places, a chapter-by-chapter analysis of William Saroyan's 1972 memoir, Places Where I've Done Time. Today, we examine Chapter 18, Typewriter Shop, 6th Avenue at 44th Street, New York, 1928. Here, we return to Saroyan's formative trip to New York when he was 20 years old. Though he was only there for about five months, this was his first extended period alone and far from family. He suddenly had to make every decision for himself, and the stakes were high living in New York City. All alone in the biggest city in the country, he wrote home frequently, and he received his mail at the Postal Telegraph Company on Warren while he stayed at the YMCA for a few months. We've covered many aspects of this trip, including his stay in various boarding rooms, going to dance halls, and coming home feeling like a failure. This chapter is hopeful and prophetic. His first task in New York was to find a job, and he easily found one three days into his trip as a manager at the Postal Telegraph Company. Remember, his money was lost when his luggage was sent to the wrong place. So finding this job was imperative to surviving in the city and moving on with his real goal, becoming a rich and famous writer. So he heads to the typewriter shop, spending $60 on a new Corona typewriter. That's roughly $944 in today's money. A large sum for most 20-year-olds ever. He tells us he could have paid half the price for a sturdy second-hand machine, but I had a good personal reason for buying the new machine. It was to be the machine on which I was to do the writing that would make my name. He had fantasies that in one evening he would write something so amazing that it would instantly rocket him to wealth and fame. And truth be told, he wasn't far off, writing the daring young man on the flying trapeze in 26 days, and it immediately becoming a hit. He wrote the human comedy in 11 days, and the time of your life in six days. It's in this shop that Sergoyan meets the friendly Jewish owner who recognizes that William is from someplace, obviously not New York. William tells him that San Francisco life is about the same as New York life, and what's interesting in this time period is the specific truth of that statement. In 1928, much of the country was still quite rural and certainly less diverse than New York. But since the gold rush days, California was a beacon for Easterners and immigrants from all around the world. And even though San Francisco hadn't quite been put on the map of great cities of the world yet, it still hummed with life and the sense of motivation and reinvention that was also characteristic of New York. Meeting this Jewish New Yorker wasn't particularly different for William who even in Fresno knew Jewish kids. In 1946, when Saroyan bought a house on Terraval Avenue in San Francisco for his family, his wife, Carol, couldn't get used to it. To her, San Francisco was still a backwater, too far from New York or Los Angeles for friends to pass through. But William saw it differently. San Francisco was always his home base. Though he spent much time in New York over his life, and that's where he was able to produce the plays he wrote, California drew him home. Eventually, to calm Carol, he did rent a New York apartment for her while they owned the Terrible House. They compromised and split their time between the two, but in 1948 they had to sell the Terrible House anyway, and it was back to New York for a stint. Back to the typewriter shop. I urge you to pause this presentation now and read this letter William wrote to his mother on October 7th, 
1928. William goes back for more ribbon, and the owner tells him that Lehman will be governor of the state someday. At this point, William describes his politics to us readers, and that consists of all politicians being frauds, including Washington, Lincoln, and Jackson, who apparently, even in 1969 when this book was written, was considered a little gauche to lump in with Washington and Lincoln. He says he included Jackson because when he was a kid, he saw a bad painting of Jackson giving an acorn to a tired soldier, and he liked that humility. In A Seaside Friendship, published in I Used to Believe I Had Forever, Now I'm Not So Sure, and first appearing in 1956 in Spadea magazine, he writes, As I walk on my own two feet, vanity, ambition, and other absurdities fall away from me, and I view the world with the clear eye of art, truth, wit, and humility. Humility was always a big deal to him. With regard to those ex-presidents mentioned in the Places chapter, he shrugs them off with the statement, You can't be with any government and not thereby be compromised forever. It's a feeling that still resonates with many today, and this was actually written before Watergate and the massive loss of national innocence that the Nixon scandals laid upon the country. Saroyan was never shy about his politics, and also not shy about avoiding his taxes, which piled up so high that he hid out in Paris to avoid the IRS, and try to make a little money so that he could return to the U.S. and pay down some of his debt. At times, his vocal disgust with corruption caused certain groups to adopt him, though he never reciprocated. Though he wrote for the Marxist magazine New Masses in 1934, and shared some of its writers' communist views, he specifically noted that he was not writing on their behalf, as seen here. Saroyan tried to remain the objective onlooker, the reliable narrator, but of course his true feelings often slipped through, whether it was the anti-war sentiment in the adventures of Wesley Jackson that got him in trouble with the U.S. Army, or the thinly veiled attack on Louis B. Mayer in Get Away, Old Man. At the end of the day, he despised those with power be it economic, political, or both. He was drawn to the little guy, the wage worker or small business owner, who he felt had not yet become corrupted. Perhaps that's why he remembered the typewriter shop owner so vividly, even the prediction about who would become governor. Lehman became governor in 1933, and not only did he have political power, but he was the son of the founder of the Lehman Brothers Bank so he had economic power too. He served as governor for four terms, so the shop owner really did get it right, though he might have been mostly excited because Lehman was the first Jewish governor of New York. The typewriter was Saroyan's constant companion. He even struck a deal with royal typewriters in 1934, where he agreed to let the company use a photograph of him and say he did all his writing on their brand in return for a free portable typewriter. Spending $13 on his first typewriter and Underwood in 1921 shocked his mother, who felt the large purchase was made in vanity and that the money should have gone into supporting the family. In Here Comes, There Goes, You Know Who, he says, I lived in an awfully practical world and few members of my immediate family, and none in the whole city itself, would be very likely to notice the typewriter I bought when I was 13 without feeling impelled to sneer and say, Who do you think you are? Or, What makes you think you can write? Or, Get a load of who's a writer. I didn't want to be ridiculous. I didn't want to be ridiculed. But I bought the typewriter. I began to try to write and I kept the fact to myself. 
For three or four years, I was afraid of being ridiculed, but soon enough, I got over it. I didn't imagine I wouldn't be ridiculed. I decided it didn't matter. I had to write. Whoever had to ridicule that fact or anything I happened to write was welcome to do so and still is. Saroyan never slowed down and notably recalls how even in his sleep he would be tapping his foot. The typewriter facilitated his fast-paced thinking and living. For him to slow down was a type of death. In The Bicycle Rider in Beverly Hills, he tells us that explicitly. My mother's mother, Lucy, was forever encouraging me to move through life with what she called gyrot, which is a phonetic rendering of an Armenian word, or a word of Beatles, or a word of the Saroyan family, or a word invented by my grandmother herself, which signified, apparently, these things. To assault the world with early morning swiftness and clarity of mind, with planning, with zest, with brilliance, with cunning, with eagerness, and with skill. A man with no garret, Lucy frequently said, is dead. Even while he lives, he is dead. And he agreed, and his nickname as a messenger was Speed, and he was always running away from the dreaded boring. This chapter seems to meander, but it's a little bit about fate. The fate of Lehman as a metaphor for the fate of Saroyan and his typewriter. They were on the precipice of greatness. It's a love letter to his best, most loyal companion, that typing machine that put his thoughts to paper faster than anything else imaginable at the time. Available at all hours, confessor, time spent with the typewriter was cleansing and calming. The levity of the chapter belies the truth of his long relationship with the machine and its incredible value to him. In every one of his memoirs, the word typewriter appears, often in the form of a type of security blanket. In The Bicycle Rider in Beverly Hills, an entire chapter is called Typewriter. In Saroyan, a biography by Lee Lawrence, Artie Shaw is quoted as saying to Bill, For Christ's sake, Bill, I get the feeling your typewriter is a kind of sexual symbol. You're an autoerotic. He loved that word, autoerotic. Oh, autoerotic. Autoerotic. I said, oh shit, don't hold me up on a word. I'm making a point. I think what you're doing is jerking off with the typewriter, if you want it in plain language. Well, he hated that, hated me for saying it. And in The World of William Saroyan by Nona Balakian, she writes, For a long time, it was assumed that Saroyan's love life had but one object, his typewriter. Saroyan writes in Myself Upon the Earth from the Daring Young Man collection. Do I not worship the typewriter? Is it not the dearest possession I own? And when he pawns it for money, he misses it, saying, Day after day I longed for my typewriter. This chapter, though based on a place and a moment, actually spans time, hinting at the future and being firmly rooted in the present as he reminisces about the past. It's a taste of chapters to come that get a bit more metaphysical and metaphorical. In this way, it's fine evidence of the depth of Sir Royan's writing and the connections and aha moments made all over this book. Let's put this on the Sir Royan map and move on.